Hi there. Okay, here's a talk about um, context relativity, in particular, what it might mean for belief itself to be context relative. I say belief itself to distinguish it from um, belief ascriptions having a context sensitive semantics. Okay, this I should say is work in progress. I am not at all sure of anything that's going on here, but I think it's kind of fun, so I hope I'm not wasting your time. Let's see what happens. Okay. Wrong window. There we go. Okay. Here's my topic for today. As I said, I'm interested in what it could even mean for belief itself to be context relative. So, so my thought here is um, epistemologists, by and large, are familiar at least with one model of context relativity, the sort of thing that you hear about from epistemic contextualists, who will say things like the semantics of uh, knowledge ascribing sentences are context sensitive. Okay, so I'm not interested here in an analog of con epistemic contextualism for belief sentences. I'm not interested in a view that says the meanings of belief sentences are context relative. I'm interested in what, at least at a first pass, you might think of as an analog of pragmatic encroachment. So sometimes people set up um, the contrast between contextualism and pragmatic encroachment as follows. Um, epistemic contextualists posit speaker sensitivity, so those knowledge sentences um, express different propositions according to different speaker contexts where they might be uttered, whereas pragmatic encroachers say um, there's sensitivity to the context of the knower, so what situation a subject is in might make a difference to whether they know something or not, or whether, put it this way, their um, epistemic position is strong enough to count as knowledge. Okay, so I'm interested in something like that in the sense that um, I'm interested in views where whether you believe something or not depends on features of the putative believer's context. Now that's a little bit harder to understand, I think, um, for uh, a more purely descriptive item like belief as opposed to knowledge or justification or, say, rational belief, right? So a pragmatic encroacher can say the thing that's context sensitive is the norm on um, your beliefs, right? So how much, let's say, evidence you ought to have varies with what's going on around you. But with belief, we don't have that kind of stuff. We don't have norms to hook onto and say, those are the things that are sensitive to context. So what I want to do in this talk is, uh, so my approach to addressing the question I'm interested in, what it could even mean uh, for belief itself to be context relative, my approach is to give you a bunch of, I don't know, call them models or analogies or metaphors or a bunch of examples. Um, th this paper really started because uh, I had an, another paper where I gave um, what I thought was a really nice analogy for explaining my own view of belief as context relative. Um, and I kind of thought, I, I bet there are lots of other examples of this kind of thing. I don't want to say that it's just like there's a tight analogy between uh, belief and this other phenomenon I was using as a as an example, um, weight as opposed to mass. We'll talk about that here. Um, and I also kind of thought a lot of the time when I read papers, um, a good analogy is more fun than anything else. So this is, uh, to some extent, an, an attempt to give a paper that's just analogies. I'm just going to give a bunch of examples and talk about them and tell you. I think these things are neat, and I really wish I were a high school science teacher instead of... Um, never mind, I like my job. Okay. So I'm going to try and answer the question, what does it mean for belief to be context relative by answering the more general question, what does it mean for a property to be context relative um, in the sense that I care about that I'm talking about. And the answer I'm going to give fits this schema. So I'm going to say a context relative property is a function in some sense of a context invariant property and a contextual variable. 
I'm not going to tell you right now what all that means. The whole idea here is I'm going to illustrate this by means of examples. Um, but let me say a little bit about why you should care about any of this. Probably should lead with that, right? Um, this is a clarification slide. I'm going to skip past it. I told you this is work in progress. Maybe I should make more progress before I record a video. Uh, why should we care about context relative belief? Um, the, the short answer is there have been a bunch of philosophers uh, pretty recently who've argued that belief is context relative in one way or another. Um, not just me, but also like some good philosophers. Um, I have some references at the end. Um, Hannes Leitgeb's uh, recent book has a context um, has some context sensitivity in it. Um, Scott Sturgeon's 2008 paper, Brian Weatherson, a really neat paper um, about trying to make this sort of explicit shift from um, having norms on belief be pragmatically encroached upon to doing it with just belief instead. Um, and some other people here. Um, almost all of these people uh, are worth pointing to as example. A couple of these are things I refer to for other reasons. But uh, me, Fantel and McGrath's book does some of this. Dorit Genson, um, Tia Gao, Dan Greco. Yeah, all neat things. Okay, here's where we were. So a bunch of people have argued for these things, but really the question why should we care about this maybe uh, should be pushed a little bit further. Why do those people care about context relative belief, just in case you don't actually care about them to begin with, which would be strange. They're fine people. Um, so the the typical reasons that people give for uh, going context relative or context sensitive or whatever you want to call it um, will either involve trying to explain um, shifty intuitions about like pairs of cases. Maybe we want to say the sort of things that contextualists appeal to to make those um, to argue for those sorts of claims about the semantics of knowledge descriptions. You might want to say really what changes between um, one case and another in a pair is uh, the the change that matters is whether somebody believes something and not um, whether we'd say they're justified in believing it or whether they know or something like that. Um, also, reconciling full and partial belief, um, or, or if you like, recognize, reconciling logic and probability or um, belief and credence or some, some kind of pair of things here. Um, and not unrelatedly, uh, trying to uh, give nice answers to the lottery and preface paradoxes or versions thereof. Okay, I'm not going to go too much more into detail about that kind of thing. That's what you can find in those things um, I had in the references. Okay, here's what I really want to try and get across today. Um, if, if you are persuaded of these three things, I'll be happy. First of all, the examples I'm going to give you um, have enough in common to be worth grouping together, which is otherwise not totally obvious, I think. Um, and second, that what they have in common is usefully described as context relativity. I've, I, so I'm not a metaphysician. I'm talking here about what I'm calling metaphysical context relativity. Maybe somebody out there has already said, um, here's what context relativity is, and maybe even the answer is the thing that I'm talking about. But So part of what I want to persuade you of today that comes from one and two here, my claims one and two here, is like context relativity is a thing. This thing that I'm calling to, calling context relativity is indeed a thing. Um, if we get that, then I think this third thing is going to come, and I care about this third thing. Uh, the difference between these different examples of context relativity, the difference between them suggests we need to be careful about what we can infer from a phenomenon's being context relative. What I mean by that is sometimes when I say, um, according to my view of belief, belief is context relative, I will get responses that, uh, objections that aren't sensitive to any of the details. Objections that will say, well, if belief is context relative, then we should expect that phi. So I'm, I'll be a bit more specific as we get into the details, but I would like to respond to those sorts of objections by saying, well, here are two different context relative phenomena, one of which makes phi true, the analog of phi true, and the other of which makes it false. So just from the fact that I say belief is context relative, it doesn't follow that phi is going to be true. So you're going to have to look at the details of my view before you can um, 
raise that sort of objection. Okay, here's the outline. Um, I am going to talk about five different examples, um, four of them taken from sort of high school science. Um, not for any deep reason, but just because those are examples I thought of. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to go through each of those relatively briefly, and then at the end I'm going to sort of collect them all up and say, uh, here are differences that I see between them that I think are important, um, and here's how those sorts of things carry over, give us lessons for thinking about context relatively. Okay, let's get into the examples. Um, the first one, superlative properties. I'm thinking of superlative properties here, not just superlative words, but maybe properties that are picked out by superlative words. So I'm thinking here of properties like tallest, shortest, richest, poorest, um, other -est things. So here's how those uh, properties fit the schema that I gave before. Let me actually come back to that schema. I'm going to color code things in future. I don't know why words are disappearing here. That's odd. Um, so I'm going to say a context relative property uh, for which I'll generally use bold text is a function of red text, a context invariant property, and blue text, a contextual variable. So superlatives, properties like tallest, shortest, richest, poorest. I'm going to say whether you're the tallest person depends on, first of all, here's a context invariant kind of thing, your height, and two, a contextual variable, the heights of other people in the relevant comparison class. Okay, and the important thing here is that, for me, is that you can be the tallest person in one group while not being the tallest person in another group. So, am I the tallest person? Well, I'm the tallest person in my house. The only other people here are um, somebody who's about a foot shorter than me and a bird who's, like, that big. Um, but I'm not the tallest of my siblings. In fact, I'm the shortest of my siblings. Not that I care about that. Okay, so here's what I here's here's why I think it's worth thinking about um, a superlative property according to the schema that I've given. Um, it's easy to make sense of two importantly different ways of changing a superlative property of going from being the tallest to not being the tallest anymore. Right? One way I could uh, lose the property of being the tallest person in the house is for me to actually lose some height, right? If I shrink, that's like a change in me myself. On the other hand, if a tall person enters the house, I again go from being the tallest to not being the tallest anymore. Um, but that doesn't involve a change in me myself. It involves a change in my context. What's a context? I'll come back to that later. Okay. Nevertheless, um, even though a uh, uh, Superlative property is context relative in this kind of way. Um, even though a context relative property, uh, even though a superlative property of con context relative in this kind of way, it's still like real. It's still a thing we can care about. It's still a thing that might sort of bear normative weight, right? You can easily imagine thinking um, the tallest basketball player ought to be the one to take the tip off the. Um, the wealthiest person ought to pay more tax, or at least ought to pick up the tab for dinner, or something like that. These things might make a difference, and uh, the the comparison class um, may be something that is um, that's variable, that's in some sense arbitrary, but it still might matter. Okay. More interesting examples. Here's the one that I. I said at the beginning, I sort of fell in love with. Um, I, I have spent uh, more time than I can really justify reading about um, weight and mass on mostly Wikipedia. But here's something I got pointed to by Wikipedia. Here's a way of giving the distinction between weight and mass um, that fits with the way I learned about it in, in high school. Uh, which is reassuring. So this is from a, a technical manual from the introduction to the U.S. 
NIST Handbook 130 Uniform Laws and Regulations in the Areas of Legal Metrology and Engine Fuel Quality. People who are going to be careful about fine distinctions, right? So here's the beginning of it. They say uh, the mass of an object is a measure of the object's inertial property or the amount of matter it contains. The weight of an object is the measure is a measure of the force exerted on the object by gravity or the force needed to support it. Okay, so a couple of things to notice here. One is that in this definition, in these two definitions, um, we actually see four different um, four different things grouped into two bunches of two. So mass is a measure of inertial property or the amount of matter it contains. Weight is a measure of force exerted on the object by gravity, so at the Earth's surface, a downward force, if we're thinking in those sorts of terms, or the force needed to support it, that's an upward force. Newton tells us that those two forces are going to be the same, typically. Um, Newton also tells us that um, a measure of the object's initial property is also going to be a measure of the amount of matter it contains, but at least a priori, it's not obvious that these four things are going to go together in those kinds of ways, right? Um, Descartes, I read, uh, thought that the amount of matter an object contains is a geometric property. Uh, so a, a large, uh, so sorry, yeah, a large, not dense, whatever the opposite of dense is, a large, not dense object will, according to Descartes, um, contain more matter than a small, dense object, even if, according to the modern conception, the, the largeness and the denseness sort of balance off against each other equally, right? So if both of them require the same uh, amount of force in order to accelerate them at the same rate, that is, they have the same um, inertial property, according to Descartes, they would, they nevertheless would have a different amount of matter. He would not be swayed by facts about um, inertial property in making judgments about amount of matter, amount of matter contained. Okay, so four things here grouped into two. Some kinds of forces that have something to do with gravity or what's needed to support an object, which by the way, again, on a Newtonian picture, actually in some contexts not going to be the same thing. So in a, in a minute I'm going to talk about um, weightless objects in orbit. Um, and depending on which of these things you think defines the object's weight, they either are or aren't going to be literally weightless. Ah. And of course, if you're um, Einstein, then uh, distinguishing gravity from other kinds of forces isn't going to make any sense because gravity isn't really... <sighs> I told you, I spent too much time reading about these things. Okay, here's the basic um, high school level distinction. One of these things is about a force measure, um, a force exerted by gravity measured in, let's say, newtons. The other is a measure of inertial property measured in, let's say, grams. Okay. As I say, the dis did I say this? I'll say it now. The distinction is a Newtonian innovation. Um, I gather there's some controversy about whether Huygens might have had the same idea before Newton published about this, but it seems to be generally agreed that Newton is the first person to clearly distinguish these two ideas um, as we recognize them, weight and mass. Um, we, we might say like each of these sort of component parts were around before, right? Each of those four different things, inertial property, amount of matter, etc., etc. Um, uh, earlier scientists had these ideas and would talk about them and examine them, but it, it's a Newtonian innovation to say, I'm going to uh, bundle up inertial property and amount of matter, and on the other hand, uh, forces from gravity and support forces. Um, I, I think it's not a coincidence that the two arise together, so a part of what I've got in uh, a concern that I have along the way here is when is it a good idea for us to postulate context relativity? I think for each of the examples that I give you here, except for superlatives, which are kind of a toy example, um, the answer is going to be something like a law-like relationship between um, context invariant property, contextual variable, and context relative property. Okay, so I, I think it's not a coincidence that um, even as you're going through like 
uh, Newton's publications and drafts of his work, the distinction, the, cl the clear distinction between weight and mass as we're bundling those things up together happens at the same time that um, he comes up with a universal theory of gravitation. But I'm not a historian, just as I'm not a metaphysician. Okay. So here's what I say about why this isn't a coincidence. When we have reason to say that gravitational force is proportional to inertial property, according to Newton's law of universal gravitation, we have reason to distinguish weight from mass. Now, uh, yeah, I just said this stuff about the NIST definition bundling things up. Okay. So here's the picture we wind up with. Here's how I apply my schema for context relativity to weight. I say an object's weight, that's bold, so I'm calling that a context relative property, is a function of one, its mass, it's red, so it's context invariant, I'm saying, and two, the distribution of matter around it. That's a contextual variable. Okay. So distribution of why is that something that matters? Because that's what uh, Newton's theory says is the other um, input in um, the the law of gravitation, right? So the gravitational force exerted on a body is um, proportional to the masses of the relevant objects and inversely proportional to the square of their distance. So I'm using distribution of matter as a phrase to capture amounts of matter and how far away they are. Okay. So here, right, mass is the context invariant property and distribution of matter is a contextual variable. What exactly do I mean by a context? I said I'd talk about later. It's probably about time I said that. Um, in general, I want to leave that unspecified um, because I think this is going to vary depending on the kind of example we're looking at. Um, so filling out the schema, by, by which I mean the schema saying Context relativity means being a function of context invariant and contextual variable. Um, filling out the schema in the case of a given context relative property will tell us what counts as a context for that case. Typically, I want to say a context is something that determines the values of a contextual variable. So in the case of weight, a context is a distribution of matter outside the object in question. Um, I guess I could say so here's how I filled out the schema for weight. I said the context invariant property is mass and the contextual variable is distribution of matter. We could have said the distribu the sorry, the contextual variable is a gravitational field, and then Newton gives us an answer to the question, um, what determines a gravitational field? So maybe you think a gravitational field is something like um, a function from positions to gravitational forces, or positions and masses to gravitational forces. Um, and then you might say, well, how do we know what the gravitational force is at a given point? So if we're asking this about many points, we're asking how do we, uh, what determines what gravitational field um, applies to a given region? Uh, well, the Newtonian answer is a distribution of matter. So maybe you want to call that a context. Um, and then what, however you decide to fill out this schema is going to be your contextual variable. OK. I want to, so th that's enough to understand why I want to say that weight is a uh, context relative property. But while, while we're thinking about that handbook, let me um, turn on to a couple of things. So one of those um, objections that I wanted to answer. So an objection that says, well, you claim belief is context relative, therefore phi and phi is false, so you're wrong. Um, one of those kinds of objections will say, um, you say belief is context relative, therefore you must predict um, certain things about how we would use the word belief in English. And my um, initial and kind of no fun and feels kind of weaselly response to this is, I don't have anything to say about semantics. Why would you expect that a philosophical account of what belief is would tell you anything about how people use the word believe in normal English? Um, which feels kind of bad. But here's a better way to answer that. Um, here's a concrete example of something that I claim is uh, something that I claim is context relative, but where First of all, ordinary use of this perfectly normal word weight 
doesn't fit with the technical um, use, the scientist's conception of weight. And furthermore, even very careful technical manuals that are telling you not only what these two different things are, but how to use the words in any rules you're going to give, carries on and says, okay, so, so here's a fact about ordinary people, the unwashed masses in trade and commerce and every, everyday use, um, use the term weight as a synonym for mass, often. But we careful people, well, when used in this handbook, the term weight means mass. I just told you that these things are different, but I'm always going to use them the same way. And furthermore, the following note appears where the ter term weight is first used in a law or regulation. And the note says, when used in this law or regulation, the term weight means mass. We know that things are different, but we don't care. We're just going to talk about them as if we're, we're going to smush the things together in ordinary life. And that's fine. That's not weird. That's totally normal. This is... This is not a knock on the NIST. It makes sense for them to do that, especially when in trade, in commerce, and ordinary everyday use, people use the terms interchangeably. If we're going to um, mark a distinction between them when we're writing rules and regulations that are going to be read in trade, and commerce, and everyday use, we're going to be misunderstood. Okay. So here's what I want to take from this. This suggests that ordinary speech, or even careful speech, isn't going to tell us much about the distinction between weight and mass because ordinary speech doesn't distinguish them at all. Maybe the right thing to say is that ordinary speech involves one concept that combines both weight and mass. So just as our, ordin our, our idea of mass involves smushing together two things, inertial property and quantity of matter, and weight involves those two plus gravitational force. Uh, sorry, maybe then ordinary weight involves those two plus gravitational force. I told you this is a work in progress. I don't actually know what I think. Okay. Nevertheless, ordinary thinking specifically about gravitational force or weight explains some things we might say. I do think we can, that is, what I'm trying to say now is, um, I do think sometimes when we're trying to explain what's going on with ordinary talk about weight, um, we actually care about the, the thing that I've just talked about as weight as distinct from mass. So, when you see something like this, despite the fact that the measurement here is in kilograms, when, somebody, when the sign says, please don't put heavy stuff on the table, here's the weight limit, the thing that matters is the gravitational force. This table might be able to bear more mass if you take it up to a high enough altitude so that the same mass receives a lesser gravitational force. Or, I don't know, if some, something happens to reduce the mass of the Earth, um, the thing that's going to make a difference here is um, gravitational force. Okay. Before we go on, um, I, I also want to make a distinction here for, for a reason. Okay, so here's something that might have come to mind for you, a, a more standard philosophical distinction, a distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic or relational properties. I say this might have come to mind for you because I spent a while thinking maybe the thing that I care about here that I'm, I'm now calling context relativity is in fact extrinsicality, right? Um, I, I, my, maybe what I really want to say is those of us who are calling belief context relative really think it's more extrinsic than other people do. I'll tell you that's why I think that's not quite what I want, but um, just just to, in my own defense, I don't think it was unreasonable for me to think that maybe what I was interested in was intrinsic and extrinsic properties. Um, here are the opening sentences of the Stanford Encyclopedia article on intrinsic versus extrinsic properties. We have some of our properties purely in virtue of the way we are. Our mass is an example. We have other properties in virtue of the way we interact with the world. Our weight is an example. The former are the intrinsic properties, the latter are the extrinsic properties. Okay, so it seems natural, uh, if we just go this far, to say, um, well, maybe then what I'm calling context invariant properties are the intrinsic ones, and um, context relative ones are extrinsic. But this isn't quite what I want, because, as I say here, we can have context relative properties that are not extrinsic. Okay. I think also we can have uh, what 
so we've already seen with superlatives some examples of um, the other kind of contrast. So uh, what I'm calling context invariant properties that are not intrinsic. So when I when we talked about the example of being the wealthiest, right, the context invariant property there was wealth, but that's not intrinsic. That is definitely extrinsic. Okay. Uh, but we can also have, I'll now say, context relative properties, things like weight, that are not extrinsic. Um, I'll give you an example right after this. Here's, here's another distinction, though, that I also sometimes think maybe I care about. Um, accidents and essences. Okay, so part of the way that I'm articulating the, the difference between context relative and context invariant properties is one of them you can uh, change without changing what the object is and not the other, right? You can change an accidental property of an object without changing what the object is. You can change whether I'm the tallest in this house um, without changing anything about me. So, so I don't become a new person um, when somebody else enters the house. Whereas, okay, if you change an essential property of an object, you destroy the object or change it into something new. I've already told you why that isn't quite the right distinction. Think of a superlative like, wel like wealthiest or even tallest, right? So um, if, I, uh, if I lose my legs, then I'm going to be shorter. Or if I just age and get osteoporosis, I, I will probably wind up being shorter. But um, as long as that uh, happens without anything else, changing to essentially about me, I'm plausibly the same person. Okay, so can we find a better model for the distinction between changes in context invariant properties versus contextual variables? For shorthand, I'll call these two kinds of changes a uh, proper change versus a mere context shift. Um, I think we can, and I think we can find it by looking at another, uh, going to a different high school science class um, and what in at least my chemistry class was called uh, the difference between physical and chemical change. I'll give you two examples under this heading of context relative properties. So phase state, solid, liquid, gas, plasma, etc. Uh, the phase state of a sample and um, a couple of properties of ideal gases. That's where we're going to go in this section. Okay. So here's that distinction um, between physical and chemical change. I went and found a chemist's dictionary in my university library when those were still open. Um, here's a definition. Chemical change is rearrangement of the atoms, ions, or radicals of one or more substances resulting in the formation of new substances often having entirely different properties. Such a change is called a chemical reaction. Chemical changes should be distinguished from physical changes in which only the state or condition of a substance is modified, its chemical nature remaining the same. That sounds to me a whole lot like um, a context shift. Uh, just to make things confusing, there are also physico-chemical changes which have some of the characteristics of both, and I don't understand what this is at all, so I'm going to try and ignore those. Um, here are some examples of three types. Chemical changes, for example, um, fuel and oxygen producing carbon dioxide, water, and heat, or water plus carbon dioxide plus energy producing sugar and oxygen. Uh, physical changes, water to ice to steam, crystallization, coagulation of latex, distillation processes. Okay, physico-chemical changes are complicated, and we will not talk about them. Let's forget they happened. Okay, just to get some more terminology, once we've got physical and chemical change on the table, I think we can also distinguish between physical and chemical properties. So chemical properties are the ones that are invariant across physical changes. You need a chemical change to change a chemical property. So for instance, volume, temperature, crystal structure, phase state, these are physical properties because they can be changed by non-chemical processes. They're not chemical properties. But note that all of these seem pretty intrinsic. Okay, I'm in a second going to say, um, let's take some examples, and I'm going to call those context relative but they're still intrinsic. Uh, 
um, what counts as a chemical property. Um, as far as I can tell, it seems to generally be atomic or a molecular structure. I'm a little uncomfortable with those being my only examples because uh, despite the way the definition here started with talking about atoms, ions, and radicals, I think the distinction between chemical change and physical change is much older than modern atomic chemistry, um, although I am having trouble tracking down exactly where it came from. Um, Aristotle, at least, seems to have had some kind of distinction here. Uh, so I would like to have examples of macroscopically observable chemical properties that don't just involve atomic and molecular structure. These, the, these typically have to do with reactivity, but the, I haven't found a neat definition of um, a property of reactivity that isn't, let's say, um, affected by crystal structure. So ah, what exactly is a chemical property? Let's say like um, chemical composition. If we're if we're allowed to talk about atomic and molecular structure, then we can say like the um, you know which uh, compounds, which elements are involved in the substance you're looking at. Okay, so like when you recombine from O2 and something else to CO2, you've changed a chemical property. When you go from CO2 to, I don't even know what that is, it's got like C's and H's in it, to something else. And H2O, oh yeah, there's a thing I know, H2O, that's a different thing. When those chemical formulas change from one end of the arrow to the other, you've got a, you've got a change in a chemical property. That's what I want. Okay, so let's take two of these physical properties as our examples of context relativity first volume of an ideal gas uh, and phase state. So in both cases there's a law-like relation between the context relative property, a context invariant property, and some contextual variables. For the volume of a gas the context invariant property is amount in moles. By the way this is not mass. We have yet another concept aside from amount of matter, um, inertial property, gravitational force, support force, this is something more like number of particles. So uh, the same amount of oxygen gas will be have uh, be much more massive than uh, an equal amount of hydrogen gas, for example. Okay, the context invariant property for volume of gas is amount. The contextual variables are pressure and temperature. So this comes from the ideal gas law that tells you pressure times volume equals amount times a constant times temperature. Okay, that's volume of an ideal gas. For phase state, the context invariant property is the, is the chemical composition, and the contextual variables are pressure and temperature. So um, do I have a graph here? I don't have a graph here. Um, you can find, let's see if my whiteboard app is going to work, um, you can find phase diagrams for water that'll give you a graph like this where you have um, an axis for pressure, an axis for temperature, and you'll get sort of lines that look kind of like this and say, um, you know, you're, uh, I'm probably going to get these wrong because I'm doing this on the fly, solid and liquid and gas, depending on how much pressure and temperature you have. Um, and those lines are supposed to end there because if you have too much of anything, then everything goes fuzzy and uh, normal things don't apply anymore. Um, science is neat. Anyway, that's where the law-like relationship comes from. We say if you have a substance, a sample with a particular chemical composition, so what proportion of which chemicals you have, so let's say if you have pure water, um, then for any given value of pressure and temperature, the phase diagram will tell you what phase state your sample is going to be in. So for these examples, we can say, look, there are two very different ways to affect a change in a physical property like volume. One would be add more gas. That changes a context invariant property. Okay, if everything else stays fixed, but you add more gas, you're going to have more volume. On the other hand, while keeping the amount of volume fixed, we can change the temperature or pressure that it's subjected to. Um, and that's a change in a contextual variable. If you raise the temperature of your gas um, and allow uh, pressure to vary, then you'll get, sorry, if you can keep the pressure constant but increase the temperature and allow volume to vary, then you're going to get increased volume. Right. 
Likewise for phase state, here are two importantly different ways of turning liquid water into gas. One, you can electrolyze it and then you get hydrogen and oxygen gas. You get a change in context invariant property because you get a change in um, chemical composition. You will wind up with no water and instead there's no H2O, there's H2 and there's O2. Or you can turn water into a gas by boiling it. You're still going to wind up with water, um, but it's going to be a gas instead of a liquid. Okay, why is it worth marking out the difference between change one and change two in either case? Well, because for certain purposes, one of these things is naturally regarded as a change in the sample itself, and two, as merely a change in here, I'm going to take the wording from Holly's chemical dictionary, um, the preparation of that sample, the state or condition, oh, I didn't use his words, um, the state or condition, the preparation of that sample. Um, yeah, I'll leave that there. This video is getting long. Okay, something worth noticing for one of the cases, so for phase state, there's an asymmetry between the context relative property and the contextual variables. Uh, it, that is, it's natural to think of changes in phase state as caused by changes of temperature and pressure, but not vice versa. We might, you know, ask the question, why did the water freeze? Well, because uh, the temperature dropped far enough while the pressure stayed constant. But it doesn't seem uh, that if we ask um, why did the temperature go down, something like because it froze doesn't seem like such a good answer. We don't usually think of the change in phase state as causing a change of temperature or pressure. So there's a temptation uh, to think that context relativity maybe implies or involves some kind of causal arrow or maybe even reducibility or something like that. Um, but on the contrary, there's no such asymmetry for volume of a gas. So remember for volume, our context invariant property was amount, our contextual variables were pressure and temperature. But we can turn that around, right? We can, instead of causing changes in volume by change, by manipulating pressure and temperature, we can do the opposite thing. So think about having a flexible container that fully encloses some amount of gas. So um, take something that's uh, like bendy but not stretchy. Um, if you've got that thing in the shape of a sphere, then you have the maximum um, volume that the thing inside uh, can possibly take while it's contained in there. If you sort of squash it, it's going to have the contained area is going to be smaller. Well, if that thing continues following the ideal gas law, then it's while its volume changes, its pressure and temperature, uh, one or both, is going to have to change. So. Which thing we regard as context relative, the designation of one property as context relative and another as contextual variable might be a choice. Um, what would make us make those choices? Well, imagine what we're thinking about is something like um, needing to, so on the one hand, here's a case where you might want to think of um, volume as your context relative property. So imagine we're using some container that's open at one end that's going to travel through some kind of environment that has uh, variations in temperature and pressure we might want to make sure that the volume of the sample of gas we're trying to transport isn't going to ever um, get so high that some of it escapes the container on the other hand if we're thinking about transporting a, 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 a gas in that flexible ball but um, we need to be careful that as the, the, you know, the flexible but fully enclosing container is um, distorted, so changing the volume of the thing inside, that we don't get extremes in pressure or temperature that would burst the container. Okay. I think that makes sense. So sometimes we might get an asymmetry between contextual variable and context relative property, but not necessarily. Okay, last example, special relativity. Um, I, I would be remiss if I gave high school science examples of context relativity and talk, didn't talk about special relativity, because, well, I, I mean, it's cool, it's cool, right? All right. Um,
just as a beginning point, we can say, look, certain physical properties, whether you're Einstein or somebody before, certain physical properties are relative to a reference frame. So even in classical mechanics, it's true for position, velocity, acceleration. Um, we can say relative to an observer sitting on the shore, the ship is in motion, but relative to an observer sitting on the ship, the shore is in motion, like in the opposite direction. Um, in special relativity, the the interesting thing is that other quantities like length, mass, and time are also frame relative. Um, and those are actually um, more helpful as well as cooler um, to think about because I think we're very accustomed to making adjustments for this kind of frame relativity, right? So it's easy for us to think, even while you're sitting on a ship, um, although I, the shore seems to be moving relative to me. I think that's because I'm moving and it's staying still, and we sort of automatically make those kinds of adjustments. Um, this stuff is more confusing and rarely comes up in ordinary life. So let's take mass as an example of a context relative property. Then I'll say uh, mass is determined by the context invariant property rest mass and the contextual variable reference frame. Um, some notable differences from our previous examples. First of all, the context invariant property is not directly measurable independently from the context relative property. Right. So unlike, say, with mass and weight, we have completely different kinds of measurements of those things. If you want to test the mass of something, you push on it with a given force and measure the acceleration. Um, if you want to test its weight, you see what force it exerts or uh, needs to be exerted on it in order to support it. But in this case, the rest mass just is our context relative property, that is mass, relative to um, a not arbitrary reference frame, but a particular reference frame, namely the reference frame in which the object is at rest. That's where it's going to have the minimum mass, and so we just call that one the rest mass. Um, the contextual variable also, by the way, is not a feature of the object situation. Right? It's more like a property of a uh, possibly hypothetical observer. Um, I sometimes wonder if um, observer dependence might be another thing that epistemologists could usefully single out um, apart from speaker dependence and subject dependence, also observer dependence. Okay, let's talk about belief. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, so first of all, I'll just say, if belief is context relative, and I think it is, it could be like any of these models or bits and pieces of some of them. Um, but I want to say these models support different inferences about belief. So for example, um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, here are a couple of quick and dubious inferences that we might make about um, context relative accounts of belief. So we might say, if the contextual variable in um, uh, context relative account of belief is a property of the believer or of the believer's situation, then you might say we can only make sense of a current belief because if we're talking about your situation um, and you're like asleep or something, then there's nothing happening there, right? If we want to talk about um, what whether you um, believe something you're not thinking about at all, then how can that depend on uh, your changing circumstances? Okay, um, I've seen this objection pressed against at least uh, my version of context relative belief. Um, so Alex Worsnip has uh, a paper where he talks about these things, which I should cite here. And I swear in the written version of this paper, I do cite. Okay, um, so for instance, if the contextual variable in your account, as it is in mine, is something like possibilities ignored on the one hand or taken seriously on the other hand by the believer, it looks like we're talking about a property of the believer being our contextual variable. Um, but look, when you're sleeping, you're not taking anything seriously. You're, if you like, ignoring everything. So we might then want to say, you don't believe anything, according to my, I'm skipping steps here, but you might think that kind of thing. Um, on the other hand, if we think a contextual, the contextual variables that figure in our account of context relative belief, maybe what we care about is conversationally salient possibilities. Um, uh, John Hawthorne's um, Knowledge and Lotteries um, has, has a bit where it talks about um, 
belief possibly being sensitive to uh, conversationally salient possibilities um, when he talks about uh, belief itself being um, sensitive to the situation of the believer. But, okay, maybe more plausibly, if we're thinking about conversationally salient possibilities, they matter because of, well, the conversation you're in. So we're looking at speaker dependence. So maybe here's another what I'm going to call a quick and dubious inference. If the contextual variable in your account is a property of a conversation or of a speaker or whatever, then we must be talking about semantics and not metaphysics, right? Okay, I'm going to say uh, neither of these things quite work, and we can see that from some of the models that we've already looked at. So let's talk about non-occurrent belief. Take weight as a model, first of all. The contextual variable here is a gravitational field, which is a property of the object's situation. But I think we can still make sense of non-occurrent weight. Some some al analogy of the idea of non-occurrent belief, but applied to weight. So here's an example. Um, the International Space Station, which last I checked, is still up there. Um, it's been a while since I checked. Uh, it's weightless in its current situation. Um, and there's at least one account of weightlessness that makes that true. Uh, now suppose we're planning to bring it back down from orbit and transport its parts somewhere. While it's still up there, while it's still weightless, I can perfectly intelligibly say we can't drive this module over that bridge. The module weighs too much. So imagine we're going to bring the thing down and then transport the parts somewhere to be studied so we can see what happens to uh, space station parts when they come back from space. Um, we're making plans. I can say this module weighs too much. Right? That I, can't, I can't put it on the table on the train because it's more than 25 kilos. Um, I think What's going on here is I, I am in fact talking about a property of the module. I'm talking about its weight, not its mass, right? The thing that matters for whether it can get over the bridge is how much force it's going to put on the bridge. Um, but we're talking here not about its weight relative to its current circumstances, but its weight relative to the circumstances it would be in if I put it here. I think that makes sense. But on other models, that doesn't work so well. So take phase state, for example. Um, I'm comfortable talking about whether my ice sculpture would melt or whether it would be liquid in this room. But it sounds weird to me to say it is liquid at room temperature. right? I think I can say, we can't keep the ice sculpture in here. It will melt at this temperature, or it would melt at this temperature. But if I say, we can't keep the ice sculpture in here. It's a liquid at this temperature. That sounds really weird. Um, I think this suggests, only suggests, um, that we're much more comfortable thinking about something like non-occurrent weight than non-occurrent phase state. You're in whatever phase state you're in. And you might change to another one, but we don't think of currently possessing the let's say, dispositional phase state. Um, yeah. So if belief is relative to possibilities taken seriously by the believer, then if it's like weight, sleeping believers will still have beliefs, albeit non-occurrent ones. But if belief is like phase state, then we wind up saying just that not that believers have dispositional beliefs, but just dispositions to believe. Um, so you're going to have to look at the details of the particular context relative account of belief um, that you're interested in, and even just figuring out that much that this um, uh, is the contextual variable isn't enough to answer the question, can we have non-occurrent belief? Okay, metaphysics rather than semantics. Um, I said if we're looking at something like, the quick and dirty inference here was something like um, if the contextual variable is a property of a speaker or a conversation or something like that, then we must be doing metaphysics rather than semantics. Well, okay. Think about relativistic mass. The context relativity of mass is definitely metaphysical or physical. Um, I, I say metaphysical rather than semantic. I've had some pushback here. Let's at least say metaphysical as well as semantic. It's not just a matter of the semantics, right? It's the property, not our speech or not just our speech, that varies with context, right? The things that um, Einstein discovered or predicted or invented whatever you want to call it, um, have to do with the, the way things are out in the world, not just with how um, we should or do talk about them. 
but the contextual variable there is a reference frame, which is not a property of the object, it's a property of an observer. So again, I think maybe this observer-speaker distinction is a useful one for epistemology. It's not the same thing. You can have observers, uh, you can have hypothetical observers um, defining a reference frame without being part of any conversation. Okay, I'm going to skip this tangent. Partly because you can pause there and see things that I kind of doubt. Um, I've become very confused about reduction is when we talk about uh, belief and credence. I have in the past described myself um, as a reductionist about full belief and credence, and now I don't. I don't, I, I don't know what that is anymore. Okay, let me just skip down to. Let me just give you a quick table putting together a bunch of properties that I think are similar or different, um, and then I will stop this obscenely long recording. Um, so here are the five um, examples that I gave. Superlative properties, weight, phase state, volume of an ideal gas, and relativistic mass, um, and the schema for each of them. So the invariant for, su for a superlative is whatever property the, you're the est of, so tallest, height is the thing that matters, wealthiest, um, wealth is what matters. The contextual variable there is the comparison class. So for weight it's mass and gravitational field, for phase state it's chemical composition, temperature and pressure, volume it's amount, temperature and pressure again, rest mass, and frame of reference. Okay, those are the five things. Here are some um, questions that we can ask about each of them and answers that I think I'd give. So can we make sense of a non-occurrent version of each one? Um, I think we clearly can for superlatives and weight. I don't think it makes sense to talk about like non-occurrent relativistic mass. Um, and I've got question marks for phase state and volume because I, I don't know what to say about that. Can we make sense of dispositional um, weight. I, I think clearly yes, dispositional um, superlative properties. Again, ju just because the contrast class can be whatever is relevant to one's interests. Um, I, I am at once both the shortest of my siblings and the tallest in this house. Um, this doesn't really have anything to do with my current situation necessarily. Um, can we make sense of a dispositional phase state uh, in the sense that uh, my ice sculpture has a perfectly robust disposition to um, change its phase state. I guess I'll say yes. Um, do we want to talk about having a disposition to a different relativistic mass relative to a different observer? I'm not sure that makes any sense. Uh, but again, I'm not a metaphysician, which means I probably don't know what dispositions are. Okay. Um, present indicative attributions of the thing. This is something that I used as evidence for a claim about non-occurrent phase state, right? So it sounds fine to me to say that module of the ISS weighs too much to go over this bridge, but I don't feel comfortable saying this ice sculpture is a liquid at room temperature. Okay, so here are my answers for those kinds of things. Um, can it be indefinite whether you possess a, a, a given property when we don't specify um, explicitly what the contextual variable is? So, if you uh, so a question like "Is Roger the tallest?" Uh, doesn't clearly have any definite answer. If you say "Is the Roger tallest of his siblings?" that's got a definite answer. "Is Roger the tallest in his house?" that's got a definite answer. "Is Roger the tallest?" doesn't have a clear answer. On the other hand, how much does Roger weigh? There's a clear answer. It makes sense for the answer just to be how much I weigh relative to the gravitational field that I'm currently subjected to. Likewise for phase state and volume. Um, what is Roger's relativistic mass? I think the right answer is it depends. How fast are you going? Okay. Um, is there a causal relationship between the um, the ingredients and the context relative property. I don't think I want to say that I um, uh, I am the tallest because in a causal sense of my height in a comparison class. That's just sort of constitutive rather than causal. Um, I don't know how to think about um, the relationship between gravitational field and Newtonian weight. Um, that's confusing. Uh, it does seem to make sense to say that your phase state, your solidness, liquidness, gasness, um, is caused by your temperature, pressure, and chemical composition. Um, uh, 
maybe it makes sense to say um, the uh, at least in the right sort of um, circumstances the volume of a given sample of gas might be caused by temperature pressure um, and amount um, relativistic mass I don't think the relationship is causal maybe I'm wrong um, is the property intrinsic superlatives generally aren't weight is that's our stock example of an extrinsic property phase state and volume those look intrinsic I don't know what re relativistic mass is maybe that's intrinsic maybe not um, is the um, is the context invariant property in our schema essential for superlatives very often no um, is mass an essential property oh heck I don't know maybe it depends what do you think um, is chemical composition of, of uh, a thing an essential property? That seems like a clear yes. Um, what about amount? Oh, again, I'm as confused as I am about um, mass, maybe even more. Um, rest mass, is that essential? The same question again. Okay, we're almost done. We're almost done. Is there an asymmetry between the uh, context relative property and the contextual variables? I, I say yes for all of these things except for volume, where we saw we could rejigger the, the schema. Um, I, I told you I'm confused about reductionist, so I'm not even going to tell you what's going on in there. Um, that's it. That's what I've got. Ah, I told you this is work in progress, so there isn't a nice ending. But here's what I want to get out of this table. Let me just um, let me just put a tack in this. Um, none of these columns, except for this one. Uh, maybe gets um, unanimous answers of either yes or no from all of our five examples. So that I think means you can have a context relative property um, that has or lacks any of these kinds of things in the headings. Super vague. Man, I. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. This took over an hour and you don't get a clear answer to anything. I had fun though. Bye bye.